So Professor Michael Heinrich presented a lecture on 13th of March 2014 titled Value Fetishism and Impersonal Domination. Now this is an author that I have followed for some time having read a little bit of his bio work and I think he makes a very important intervention in terms of the um, present and even previous debates within um, revisionist readings of Marx, which some would call revisionist, such as the Frankfurt School and the Maoists, and even some new interpretations from third wave feminism and so on. So having read this, or rather having observed the, or listened to the lecture, I made a few notes and I'd like to present them to you today. There are few authors who would dare distill the scope and classical scrutiny which Marx brings upon the mode of production into a handful of formulae, apart from bourgeois economists, of course. Yet someone who can do this while connecting the dots, so to speak, that make Marx's presentation into more than a presentation indeed into a historical movement is truly rare. This is a path which Michael Heinrich does attempt in his introduction to the three volumes of Capital. An ascent whose route endeared me enough to follow him to the lecture before our consideration today. Indicative of the author's own predisposition is the subtitle of his, as of now presently, untranslated work, The Science of Value, between scientific revolution and classical tradition, which you would have to be literate in German to study as things stand today. A note which I would like to include is an acknowledgement of the efforts of scholars such as Heinrich in Berlin and Anwar Shaikh in New York, who have chosen to present a Marxian legacy alive to its borrowings from, or rather debt, to use this now unscientific term, to the English political economy, most noticeably a labor theory of value already in the work of Adam Smith and Ricardo, which some may say, like the Hegelian dialectic, required inversion, however, that came to be for Marx himself. A brief word on this. If Smith chose to begin his presentation with a commodity which gains a tradable valence on the condition that we do not consume it ourselves, the Marxian mutation to this logic is a good-fashioned positing of presuppositions to the point where we would have to admit that a commodity would have to first be produced by independent or contractualized laborers before any question of trade arises. The issue of individuation to keep abreast of recent or perhaps classical French theory these days is what we should take care to recall. Independent producers, even when working together, make singular forms of commodities or their services have determinable jurisdictions of which they deliver their works. This is the division of labor and it is what we forget that which is happening behind our back, as it were, while we make a bowl of soup, for instance, that allows us to sit in front of whichever Netflix show for a meal. A theory of a trader would begin with the possession of a commodity, in keeping abreast with Adam Smith. A theory of value, however, would have to engage with its creation and consumption. A reminder, lest any forget, 
why economics can never become a purely computational science. For a carrot is not the same to a toad and a rabbit. Excuse my blasphemy. And make no mistake, this is a blasphemy, even by the letter of Marx's hand. For no bee ever pre-planned the hive they were constructing in advance. A characteristic which is indeed unique to human labor, of which we have attempted to say a little about. An act, if you will, which will again, which again may not be untouched by nature, just as it seeks to touch on one of her mysteries, fetishism. Let me repeat this section. And make no mistake, this is a blasphemy, even by the letter of Marx's hand, for no bee ever pre-planned the hive they were constructing in advance, a characteristic which is indeed unique to human labor, of which we have attempted to say a little about. An act, if you will, which again may not be untouched by nature, just as it seeks to touch on one of her mysteries, fetishism. And here I've basically tried to present the differences between what a theory of the commodity, which Smith begins with in classical political economy, uh, how it's basically a theory that takes the subject of its enunciation to be a trader, somebody who is already in possession of a commodity and who wishes to trade with it and not consume it themselves. Whereas Marx would emphasize the fact that any such theory would have to take into account the whole process of production. And that was his, that's in, that's in a schematic sense, his critique of political economy. But of course, I would recommend that you at least read his introduction to the um, preface of uh, 1844, I think. I think that was also what was used as the first three chapters of Capital when it came out. The form of a work at hand is perhaps how best we have learnt to consider its qualities. When this changes hands, the classical economist notices a nectarine residue. Does he, however, ask why the emblem or seal, as it were, of such an exchange took this form? For after the critique of political economy, we cannot pretend to be in ignorance of this question. However, within the tradition of classical political economy itself, we should take, in, take account of competing tendencies presented as theories regarding the expression and exchange of value in the economy. For apart from the labor theory of value, from the point of view of a trader or otherwise, we also have the utility theory of value which of course leads explanations based on marginal utility, which have gained some preponderance in neoliberalism. These theories, however, tend to be based upon the satisfaction gleaned by the consumption of one more unit of a given article and a comparison vis-a-vis -vis this and a similar investment in another commodity. To return to our lecture, however, we are reminded that it was indeed Adam Smith who presented a critique of a utilitarian theory of value by pointing out the inverted relation between the utility and price of two commodities, namely diamonds and water, the former relatively useless though valuable, the latter infinitely useful but usually inexpensive. From this, he derived that what made a commodity valuable was not its utility, but the amount of labor which went into its production. Now, this is a you probably bump into in any introduction to economics. You know how the fact that, that water is infinitely useful, we need it to live, but it's traded for fairly cheaply, whereas um, diamonds are scarce and traded for very dearly, yet they don't seem to serve any real use for us. Unless, of course, you're thinking of 
obsequious consumption and uh, exhibition themselves as possible uses. <laughs> From this he derived that what made a commodity valuable was not its utility but the amount of labor which went into its production and of course yes the fact that diamonds require significantly more labor to manufacture, cut, uh, probably place in a expensive piece of metal fashioned in the form of a ring or a earring and things of that kind. A position which it may be noticed emphasizes the commodity relation from the side of the producer and not the end buyer. It may be premature to say that the Marxian critique of the theory of value of classical political economy was already imminent in the work of Adam Smith. But the tendency to do so with the labor theory of value does arise. Hmm. Let me just repeat the chief points from this section. Adam Smith presents a critique of the utilitarian theory of value by pointing out an inversion, an inverted relation between the utility and the price of diamonds and water. That's basically what you should take from that section if the rest was not particularly helpful. So the question we have before us today is something like this. When does a trader have to consider not merely the perceived saleability of a commodity, but also production costs in terms of labor. In other words, when does a trader begin to perceive their social bond, not as a token which stands in lieu of another commodity per se, but as a bond which can make a demand upon society without a pre-given article already at hand. From the other side, when does a commodity producer or laborer come to identify beyond their own class alliances, i.e. when do they see their product, nay their very actions, to be contingent upon a slew of other divisions of labor which happen behind their back as it were, even as they are engaged in their work. The tradability of products at a marketplace is a response which intuits the site correctly and even something of the relations. Yet it does not venture far enough to ask why do these relations take expression in the form in which they do, that is in money. The commodity whose only use is in exchange. Every other commodity in the marketplace, apart from exchange, also has a use value that is distinct or that is a direct consumptive use value for a consumer. The medium which these commodities express their value vis-a-vis -vis each other remains money. At this point, we begin to intuit something of the character of impersonal domination which these transactions may entail. A brief interjection may be made, however, when Heinrich insists upon the purely social dimension of the abstraction called value. 1. It may be in reference to what the likes of Alfred Sonnrethel refer to as a real abstraction. That is, while a customer as an individual may choose to or not choose to invest in any given commodity, exchanging for it a token, leasing it, etc., or of course opting out, it is the exchange of commodities in the marketplace for such tokens which imbibe the basic commodity, money, with the value he or she uses to make a purchase. 2. Our capacity to abstract from the exchange of commodities in this way and validate or not 
a token which can secure their exchangeability is in no way a property of any of these commodities themselves. It is a purely social relation. And here I might add that the capacity to notice this itself may not be entirely social or to speak plainly common, according to Heinrich at least. And I think this is something that Marx too emphasizes. A point which is emphasized in the lecture is the distinction between concrete labor, which produces use values, and abstract labor, which produces value. A point which I have done a little to summarize. For it was important to Marx personally to clarify the importance of this distinction even someone in a managerial or supervisory role today, let us say overseeing a workshop or a factory floor, would be privy to only the concrete labor being undertaken to produce a commodity, like a chef overseeing the recipe of a soup. The only way for us to abstract from the tastes and nutritional use values of the soup is to see whether it was successfully sold or not, i.e. did someone on the shop floor place an order for it. A cashier, hence, in this position would remain the person privy to the real exchangeability of a commodity. Or perhaps some, of perhaps some anomalous interest in Marx is his insistence on a further inference it would seem, a substance of value, i.e. a material in which the abstract form of the relation we have presented above is expressed. Yet there may be a molar coordinate to this expressed by me in a perhaps flippant example. When I purchase a bulb, the shopkeeper may not have the exact change in coins to return to me for my principal. Here, it is common practice to offer an eclair or some similar lodgings when there is a remainder. This reiterates the point that value itself is social. A claim hence is actualized and you may say even tokenistically expressed in the substance of value. Value itself, however, we are reminded, is a real abstraction, abstracted as it were from any singular commodity and even any singular exchange. As what makes exchanges commiserable, money often does play the role of the substance of value. And here, in this lecture at least, Michael Heinrich does not go much beyond exchange in a marketplace, it would seem. What we should do well to keep in mind before presenting any critique is the Marxian notion of value form, which the lecturer before our consideration appears to present as a correspondence. We are also informed by a wealth of some rather new innovations which have arisen in reading Marx, of which of particular interest to me are two. One, value form theory. Here, working with the premise that a commodity's value is expressed not merely in the price it is sold for, or rather in taking into consideration the relationality of exchanges between commodities which defines any notion of price, we are led to consider the place of a certain commodity in the market vis-a-vis -vis its competitors. This is all the more the case when a market is saturated, for in each case what a new invention reveals is that it is not the market itself which is saturated, at a particular segment. To not overtly domesticate our idiom here, 
we would do well to recall that a serious criticism when Donald Trump proposed to make a 20-foot wall across the U.S. border with Mexico was that it would simply raise a market for a 21-foot ladder. There are, however, rather more sophisticated correspondences, especially in the domain of art. And here it would be a shame were we to not mention some of the formal inventions in logic, perhaps, most noticeably, Deleuze's critique of the dialectic, which beyond France has been much hailed amongst American academia and the Anglophone world as what I have elsewhere described as that strange afterglow of post-structuralism. This is a domain which would materially be representative in the mapping out of rivalries, whether political as philosophical matters of an art, or amorous, and indeed between competing scientific perspectives, even if they are regarding the question of what is it. Two. The other major tendency which have informed readings of Marx as well as Marxist readings, I'm sorry if I've conflated the delusion um, afterglow and in his critique of the dialectic and his theorization on art with value form theory itself as Michael Hendrick represents. But you know, it, uh, I, perhaps better that I didn't make three subheadings for this. Two. The other major tendency which have informed readings of Marx as well as Marxist readings in our untimely present is of course to treat his mature work, especially capital and beyond, as a monetary theory. That is a theory of relations which characterizes the social sphere by their mode of accumulation. In this sense, it remains very much a theory with class as its centerpiece but with perhaps a greater emphasis on the divisions of the working day in terms of necessary and surplus value in the composition of the capital, whether organic or technical, and of course in the workings of banks. Of this we may cite Fred Mosley and of course Michael Heinrich himself as notable examples. Having introduced in a few ways how the question of value is broached in a discourse we are live to today, we move to the other points of focus of Michael Heinrich's lecture that are fetishism and impersonal domination. It is indeed comical that Heinrich introduces fetishism as a term which has its own history, which initially may have been introduced by European colonizers upon witnessing the construction, reverence, and fear of totems. Yet he also cites Marx as, a, as the person who could turn this around and point out how fetishism is operating among bourgeois society, where effectively relations between people take on the guise of relations between things, which then appear to have qualities which the people do not. Heinrich, of course, is cognizant of layers of relations which may surface in these interactions. A capitalist, for instance, may observe the changes of prices of commodities and decide whether a certain deal is profitable or not. Similarly, the laborers employed by a capitalist are dependent on the movements of the market regarding whether the capitalist may require their work or not. These mutual dependencies, as it were, characterizing contractualizations and bonds in capitalist societies. We would also do well to note that Heinrich is not presenting an ideological critique here. In bourgeois society, these intervalent dependencies mean that objectively things do have qualities that people do not. In this sense, what he presents is some variation of an unmasking gesture. 
fetishism would hence name the relation between people where bonds are secured via the transactions of the most social of commodities. Given that each commodity is exchanged in it, money, it objectively carries a balance which people don't have. This brings the fetishistic moment, this being the fetishistic moment. This may be looked at from another, more favorable angle, however. The act of exchange was identified by Adam Smith as what makes a human being distinctly human in any social sense. Indeed, progressing to this stage may even be viewed as an advance made in society, as at the very least it removes the bonds of personal domination replacing them with exchanges which are not of a zero-sum nature. That is, I today would not obey a master because of a commandment, but within the terms of a contractually agreed upon arrangement where I offer my labor in return for a wage beyond which we go our separate ways. This, of course, marks a crucial difference between ancient slavery and modern wage slavery. In the former world, a slave tries to escape the domination of a master. In the latter and perhaps current one, a slave seeks the master who may exploit him if only to secure the means of their own livelihood. And here I am tempted to read the figures of ancient slavery as corresponding to a retiring and modern slavery corresponding to an emergent labor force. An allegory, if you will. Of course, the prime difference between the figure of the master in the ancient and the modern world is that in this contemporary moment, even the capitalist has to subject themselves to the marketplace in their effort not merely to find profitable relations but to outcompete other capitalists who may also be trying to secure for themselves relations which allow them to command labor. The sequence does present to us the importance of noticing social structures in our critique of the relations of production and not persons themselves. Michael emphasizes, however, that Marx's critique begins not necessarily with capitalist relations themselves, but with commodity production. Indeed, in this logic, which Heinrich subscribes to, to get rid of capitalism would entail at some point abandoning commodity production itself. Inasmuch as presenting our own use values as commodities entails the structure of impersonal domination. In this sense, the new reading of Marx, which is emerging, which following Heinrich, let us call value theory, would observe the experiments of a market socialism, as may have been attempted in the Eastern Bloc, with cynicism as they may have been aiming at ridding themselves of capitalist relations and its entailing structures without abandoning commodity production itself. A little wink to perhaps his own past. And it would be nice to hear about how he feels or what his experiences were, if ever the chance arises, you know, given the exigencies that were professor finds themselves in. Noticeable in this approach, which a questioner, Stipe Kurkovic, does point out after the talk, is just how different this new reading is, as it were, from the cultural analysis practiced by the Frankfurt School, and in some respects, even the Maoist. Just for some background, um, the Frankfurt School did also think about commodity fetishism, but yet they 
tried to think of it through the lens of Freud and psychoanalysis vis-a-vis -vis how we learn to identify what our worth is in society by how it is that what we offer or what we take is considered and this is in some ways culturally internalized to form something of a social psychic sense of who we are and of course they have an analysis of the cultural realm about how narratives are used and how we end up choosing which narratives to buy into or not and hence our identity becoming some sort of subscription service to a capitalist cultural industry and honestly they make a lot of sense and there are many people who still do subscribe to their point of view even today and of course you have the Maoists who have their own version of the cultural revolution and uh, I, I've, I think some of my other videos would um, bring out those moments better this is however a strictly non-revisionist account of Marxism which sticks to commodity production and the relations that facilitate it as its bedrock. The struggle against the fetishism of commodities and relations bound or occasionally submitted to them, however, is yet enunciated in this supposedly acultural critique, finding common ground with the above two mentioned schools, which are perhaps better identified as tendencies. In terms of the objections which Heinrich does face as a representative of this new reading, which we should also note here, is that he presents a circulationist theory of value, where a commodity becomes converted into a value only in its act of exchange and not in production itself. The professor, however, would present that value as conceptualized by Marx is a relational phenomena and also how precisely values get converted into prices is a rather old Marxian debate. He does emphasize, however, that value exists in exchange, a position shared by Marx, yet it is not merely exchange which regulates value. Here, production, as it were, would continue to have an instrumentalist role, but may also, as it were, withdraw its services were terms to be unmet. The bear in the room, as it were, which we have to address is how is the transition from, tra from capitalism envisioned? And here there are no easy answers. The argument for an enlarged public sphere does nothing to account for the increasing privatization of the public sphere. And I think here um, the extensive project of Necht and Kluge trying to chart a proletarian public sphere in publishing, in parties, and in, of course, universities, and in the worlds and the critiques that they offer to a prospective young high schooler today or a new parent or something. I think are worth looking up even in terms of you know the small study circles and support groups around it. It's something that I try to do a little of in my brief college years. Yeah, so the argument for an enlarged public sphere does nothing to account for the increasing privatization of the public sphere, which is where any real battle is fought in any case. And of course, you know, there are aspects of this public sphere which are um, quote-unquote un or non-public. You may say that they do not engage directly with the parliament. In some, in some occasions, they actually do. Um, but the point about these interactions is that they become um, flash post-like episodes which are basically washed over in a week and questions such as um, curriculum formation or what questions are raised in a research project or who is guiding or leading them these become things that are basically still dealt by um, departments and not decided in any of these rather dr dramatic um, confrontations as useful as it may be to um, outsource or crowdsource a policy level debate at some point I suppose 
Yet were we to solicit an answer, Heinrich would point to free associations of workers in communication with each other, making products cooperatively. And I guess this is some version of, well, what Soviets could have been like in another alternative reappraisal of history. Anyway, I shall, as you will, of course, know, leave the text in the description. I'll leave a link to the blog, which has the text. And I would say that this particular um, appraisal would require some reading, particularly to discern the points which were trying to be made earlier in the essay regarding how the abstraction that we call value, value not as some sort of universal realm of ideas which Plato might have once dreamt of, but as a, as a correspondence that emerges between what it is that I can do with a certain sum, a certain principle, let's say my own labor, and what that may mean for a prospective employer. What, can, what is the, the result, what is the sum of that product worth for myself? And I basically use it to, in some ways, pull myself to a position of satisfaction vis-a-vis -vis my own day, my week, my month. And I guess these are the questions that someone who is new on the job scene would be facing. But also questions regarding what is a commodity to me and whether this commodity is worth what it is that I may be able to offer in terms of a remuneration to the person who is selling it to me. And of course, a question regarding what kinds of commodities we do produce and how do they relate to other commodities. This being where many of the critiques of capitalism do come in. And I think we have done something to represent the map or the conceptual map that this realm of questions do entail, including bringing some new readings and some interesting tangents, such as, of course, um, French post-structuralism. And with that, I would not want to belabor this particular video. I would again remind you to read the text given the chance. And I do, of course, welcome your criticism, your feedback, particularly regarding the form of this presentation. If there are any changes that you would recommend that you think would be useful in terms of making this more comprehensible. I mean, I can't really do it very much slower than this. And I guess it is also representative of the fact that some of these issues are not entirely simple, that it has come out the way it has. And with that, I shall take your leave. Wish you a good evening. Bye-bye.